Welcome to my new video on recurrent neural networks. In this video, we're going to dig in uh, and spend a little time looking at this specific type of neural network. Hopefully by now, if you've looked at my other videos, you've got an idea that neural networks in general are almost like magic and you can do some very cool things with them. In some of my prior videos, we looked at feed forward neural networks. These were networks that took inputs, did some weight calculations and generated outputs. There could be several layers in that hidden layer area. But essentially the key difference between feed forward neural networks and recurrent neural networks is that in a feed forward neural network, the inputs that come in each time they come in do not have any context or information about prior inputs that may have been passed in. Now this is a challenge in certain scenarios where you may want to have the context of prior inputs to help derive future outputs. So this is where the recurrent neural network comes in. So a recurrent neural network is basically taking that concept of a neural network and adding some state to it. So here we have the input X coming in into that neuron A and then outputting H. But at the same time, you notice that recurrent arrow there storing some state into the neuron. And this allows it to then over time use that state to then drive some of the weights and calculations that it does. And so it's generating that context in future inputs that come in. So input X1 is going to use some of that information that came in from X0 before and so on and so forth. So in an example, let's say we have a sentence and let's say we have the clouds are in the and as a human, um, we should probably be able to relatively easily intuit that the next word could be sky here. But for an algorithm or a neural network to do this, it needs to have the context of what we're talking about. If it was a feed forward neural network, it would have a hard time intuiting what the next word could be. It could be anything because it doesn't understand the context of, in, of kind of the sentence and where that next word would be derived from. But in a recurrent neural network, because it's got the state of the full sentence and it sees we're talking about clouds, it's going to be able to intuit that the next word here is sky. Another way to look at it, here you've got a motorcycle uh, jumper doing a jump here. And essentially, if you use a recurrent neural network to predict the next step in where he was going to jump across this sequence, as it using the context of where he was before would allow you to better get an accurate prediction of where he's going to be in the future. Now, unfortunately, with recurrent neural networks, this does lead to a concept called the vanishing gradient problem. And it's a problem that essentially means the further away from the original input you get, then the less value it's going to add and you start kind of losing that original state. This is the vanishing gradient problem. So to kind of highlight what this looks like, if I have the sentence, I was living in France, and then I have a paragraph right after this, and then at some point later, uh, towards the end of that paragraph, I want to say something like I was learning to speak French and French is related to the fact that I was living in France, a machine using a recurrent neural network could look at this and may not be able to intuit French because France was too far behind and so that vanishing gradient problem came into play and it wasn't able to use the context of France because it was too early in, in, the, in the process. And so to solve this, uh, some very clever people came up with a concept called long short term memory. Very convoluted way of saying adding more complexity to storing state in the neural network. So this is taking that uh, recurrent neural network diagram we looked at earlier and showing that under the hood in the neuron to store the state, there is more complexity being added. And that's that long short term memory piece. And that just allows it to retain more information and more context to get uh, remove or reduce at least that vanishing gradient problem. Where are we seeing neural networks like this in the wild? So recurrent neural networks are used a lot. Translation is a good example of this. So being able to translate from one language to another. Image captioning is another great example of recurrent neural networks passing in an image and generating a caption from that. Uh, so that's what you're seeing here. This one's an interesting case. If you look at this text, you may think, oh, well, this looks like potentially some Shakespearean play. And in fact, it is, but it's a Shakespearean play that was generated by a recurrent neural network. Essentially, it took in a bunch of Shakespearean plays and then it was able to generate its own Shakespearean plays based on that, using the context to kind of derive the words that you're seeing here. So this is Shakespearean play, but generated by a neural network, which is pretty cool. So for, we want to kind of dive in and, and show how this works in real life and how you can build your own recurrent neural network. And for this, I want to use a uh, stock price prediction. So recurrent neural networks need history and stock price history is a fantastic thing to use. Uh, so we're going to use time series data of a specific stock price over time and use that prior history to kind of predict the next price of that stock could certainly make a lot of money if this worked really well. However, I will caveat that everything you see here shouldn't be used as investment advice or guidance. So definitely don't go and start investing all your money based on the outcomes you see here. It should just be a tutorial to show you how to kind of use recurrent neural networks to predict stock price. Um, and you can certainly enhance it over time going forward. But it should give you an idea of the power of these. And then hopefully you can kind of get an idea of how you could use them uh, for other applications too. So let's dive right into it.
So using notebooks.azure.com, let's go and create a new library here. Give it a name. And the library can hold all your resources like your notebooks and your data and other files that you want to relate to it. So it's a good way to kind of store these and then you can share them out as a public library if you want. Let's go and create this. Oh, we need hyphens here. Yes. All right, now we go and create a notebook in here. Uh, we'll use a Python notebook. So let's give it a name. Choose Python 3.6 here, hit new. Go to create test, so click this. It's going to start up that notebook. So it takes, it takes a second or so here to load. Okay, so now that it's loaded, um, right, so we want to be able to predict stock prices and we're going to use Keras for our framework for neural networks and we're going to use CNTK on the back end of that. So first let's kind of map out what we're actually going to do here. So for predicting uh, stock prices, uh, one of the nice things with notebooks is you can kind of introduce Markdown to kind of document some of your steps here in a nice easy to read format. So first we want to kind of get some historic stock prices. So let's say we're going to predict the stock price of Microsoft stock, for example. We'll get some historic stock price for that stock. Then we'll want to extract, extract the price that we're trying to predict. So this could be the closed price. Then we'll want to go ahead and create, uh, kind of normalize that data first. We we'll want to kind of normalize it so that there's, there's no wildly different ranges. Then we'll kind of create a time series. So really the recurrent neural network is going to want to see a sequence of time data. Um, we'll probably do like a week's worth of data for each entry. We'll build out our model, then we'll fit the model, and then we'll evaluate it, right? So test and evaluate. Um, just kind of see how well it performs. So those are kind of the core steps. So the first step here really is to go and get some of that historic stock data. NASDAQ has a whole bunch of this, so let's go to the NASDAQ website and go pull historic stock data from Microsoft MSFT. Here, it just loads this up, a second or so. <clears throat> we can dig down over here, it's got a whole bunch of information, but over here on the left, you can go down to historical quotes. So we'll just go down there and we're going to, when this loads, See here, well, we've got to, can choose different time frames. Let's choose the last 10 years. Nice chunk of historical stock price data. This allows you to download this in CSV format. Uh, so hitting the download here is going to go ahead and, and download that file. Now that it's downloaded, you can open this uh, in Excel. Take a quick look at it. Um, and essentially, we'll be able to kind of see what that data is. And you can, can see here what that data essentially just the start of the date for each day, the closing price, the volume, the opening price, the high and the low. That's it. So a bunch of information. So now we've got our file. Let's upload it into our library. Here we'll choose the destination file which is folder which is the library folder. This allows it to persist if the notebook shuts down. Um, and that's where it's located. And now we can kind of import that file. Great. So first step is we want to kind of leverage uh, Keras and we want to use CNTK as the back end. By default, the back end for Keras is TensorFlow, um, but we want to switch that to use the Microsoft Cognitive, Neural, uh, Cognitive Toolkit. Uh, so let's go and change that. So there's a little bit of snippet of code to go and just change that back end of Keras to be CNTK. So here we're just going to reload that. Um, essentially, there's a little function here where we'll just set the back end uh, and allow it to be CNTK. All right, so let's import some libraries that we want to use as part of this process to do some manipulation. So pandas and some math functions and a couple of graphing functions will help. So let's go drop those right in here. Set a random seed uh, so we can replicate this behavior. Let's load the data set here. So this is the data set we uploaded. So let's use the pandas read CSV function. We'll load it in from library historical quotes. Let's take a look at that. So let's go ahead. There we go, you can see the data that we saw in that file. Let's take a look at the data types here. Pretty straightforward. Notice the dates and objects, so we might want to convert that, so let's do that. Here we're just going to convert it to date time using the panda function. And then we'll probably want to use it to set as, set as an index on the date, uh, so we can sort the data based on date, because right now it's sorted the other way. So we'll set it as an index and then we'll sort it. Let's take a look at the information on our whole data set here. So you can see how many columns. We have 2,520 entries, pretty small file, across 10 years. Let's sort that index. Uh, in place, we'll sort it, so that's good. And let's uh, extract just the closed prices, because that's what we're going to try and predict. We're using, we're going to create a recurrent neural network to just predict the next closed price of our stock. So extract those out.
Here we'll just do a reshape it a little bit and then we'll plot this out in the graph and, and take a look and see what it looks like. So here we're just going to kind of plot this out and uh, see, see what it looks like. Hopefully we should see an upward swing. So there you go, kind of see it over time since for the last 10 years it's been kind of steadily rising and doing quite well over the last, last year or so. So now we need to normalize this data to kind of remove any uh, wildly vari wild variations in uh, ranges. So we'll kind of normalize everything. So uh, we'll just set that here. So we'll just create a scalar and then we'll scale out it. I'm going to use a min max scalar that we have. And so we'll just fit that scalar to our data set and we'll kind of scale it. We'll take a look and now you can see it's all we normalized between 0 and 1, which is great. Now we need to split our data into training and test. Sometimes you could argue that you should do the scaling after the fact here, but we just did it before here, so it's not a problem. Um, but essentially now we're going to split into 70% training and 30% testing. So this kind of just highlights those here. So we're going to do that split and uh, map that out. As you can see, we've got about 1,700 training and 754 testing. So now, what we're going to want to do is we now need to convert the data into a time series looking back over a period of a set number of days. So in, in, what is the context do we want to look at? We can expand it to have you know, a year, a month. In this case, we'll just do seven days worth of data to kind of look back and use for context. So stock price over seven days to predict kind of the next stock price. So essentially, we'll just create a simple function here to do that. This function is really just going to take in um, each entry and create a new entry with the last seven days before that. So it's going to kind of just do a loop over the data and get the prior seven days worth. The series here would be that kind of seven days. You could adjust it to be 30 days, 10 days. And obviously, the more you have, then the more uh, context that it has certainly could change the results and you would potentially need more computing power to do that. So seven days is good for now, um, but you can sort of play around with this. All right, so let's take a look, see what it created here. So if we just go to train X, you'll see it's got these uh, seven uh, pieces of array, pieces of data, so that's seven days worth of data uh, within that train X there. Now we're gonna reshape this into a long, short-term memory format. That's essentially number of samples, number of steps, and number of features. So we'll use reshape, we're gonna reshape train X, and it's gonna be the first piece of the shape, so how many samples are in there, and then how many steps, so there's kind of how many steps are in that, and then how many features, that's just one feature, which is close price. So we just kind of reshape that, we'll do that same, same for test here. Very, very similar process. Okay, so now that we've done that, um, we've got our data in, in the right format, and now we just need to build a model, and we'll use the, the sequential option in Keras here. We'll create a LSTM, long short time memory uh, input layer, and we'll define the input shape to match kind of that input data, which is seven. And then we'll essentially add in our dense layer here for the predictions, and then we'll compile that model. So the loss function and the optimizer, pretty straightforward. And now we just need to fit the model. So this is where we're going to do that training. So we're going to train that model on that data set. We're going to pass in train X and Y. Uh, we're going to run it for 100 epochs, and we'll do batch size of 32. All right, at this point, runs. It takes us a few seconds or so to run through, not too long, pretty quick, data set's small. Um, we're doing 100, of course, so it's going to all the time. So now you see it's completed. Now we need to test this model out. So let's create a, a set of train predictions here and run through and test this out to see how well this model that we just trained using the CNTK on the back end uh, performs against predicting the stock price. And the best way to do this would be graph it out uh, and see how it did it with our test data set. So our test data set is data it has not seen yet. First, we want to do is unscale. So we're running predictions both on train predictions and then also on the test predictions. So the train predictions it's already seen, but the test ones it hasn't. And then obviously to unscale them to allow you to get back the original values. So we'll use a scalar inverse transform function here and, and get those. So we're kind of mapping that out here. All right. So now that we've got those, we should be able to now um, calculate the mean squared error, so we'll take a look at that. As you can see, the difference is obviously the test score is a little bit higher. Um, so I haven't seen that data before. So now let's 
plot the predictions and see how well it does. So it's a good way to visualize how well it's predicting uh, the stock price. So we'll just kind of map this out here. As you can see, looking at this, um, in, as you can see, the, the plots here are pretty good overall. Um, you can see the test data is slightly off, especially towards the tail end. But you know, it's not too wildly off, and certainly within the realm of what you want to want to expect, uh, certainly something worth considering. So you can see here there is some divergence, and this is your first recurrent neural network using long short term memory, and we're able to kind of predict stock prices. And all we're using here is the closing price. So I think of other scenarios where you may look at introducing other features, such as weather or sentiment about the company and a variety of things you start introducing and then build out a more complex model start getting more realistic uh, predictions on those prices but without with just the close price itself and with some historical data was able to kind of get a reasonably uh, accurate prediction within doing a fairly decent range all right folks that's all um hopefully we'll catch you next time